Welcome back, Shalligators. Today, we are gonna talk about two celebrities that we don't usually cover here on the channel. They're not a Jenner, they're not a Bieber, they're not a Baldwin, they're a Gates. Two little Gates is actually Bill and Melinda Gates. They are getting divorced after 27 years of marriage. They're both, I think, in their 60s or something. They're, they're old. And a lot of people, when they made this announcement after being like, <laughs> two richy single people back on the market, were like, why now? Like, why get divorced now? Like, you're old, like, you really want to be single in your 60s. Like, why not just stick it out? Stick it out until the cold hand of death comes for you, they're probably both going to live to be, I mean, what, we're all going to live to be like 90, 95? That's a hell of a lot of time between 65, 25, 30 years, even 10 years. Why stick something out longer than you should? That's the question I want to know. And really, we're seeing this trend in America. They're calling it the gray divorce, which is like needlessly mean and depressing, I think. It's older Americans deciding to call it quits. And this is a very new thing because previous generations haven't done this. There was a stigma around divorce. There was the, oh my God, I don't want to start over at 65. I don't know how to date. What's a Tinder? I don't even know how to get on my face. They're just, they're old people, right? They don't know what they're doing. And they're too busy like ruining the environment, and the world economy. You know, they're boomers. But it's happening because I, and I do think the pandemic was a huge part of this. People are looking around and they're like, fuck man, life's too short. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. I got to shake things up. I got to go out there and I got to live. And I personally am a big fan of divorce. Not because I want to see, you know, I'm single. Everyone's got to be single. No, it's because when I hear about two people getting divorced, I'm proud of them. That means that they have finally looked problems in the face and they're doing something about it. Of course, it's tragic. I've been through it. It's, it ruins your soul. It just tears you limb from limb, but you're moving towards something positive. You're sad in service of healing. And in a bad relationship, you're just sad, pointlessly, for no reason. So we're going to talk about monogamy. We're going to talk about when to get out of relationships. I've done a lot of research about evolutionary biology, what studies are saying. Does monogamy make sense? Is it truly how we're hardwired? Or is it something that society has come up with? I will tell you the exact point in human civilization when monogamy became a thing. It's going to blow your mind. It has to do with farming equipment. I know. It's going to blow your mind. It's really interesting. So we're going to get into that, and we're going to talk maybe about how to build a better model of monogamy. But before we do, I just want to remind you guys to sign up for my trip to Tulum, Mexico. I partnered with influencer travel company Trend45. We're going to Mexico June 27th to July 2nd. Maybe adding another week where I'm attending. They're doing two other weeks uh, without me prior to that. But, you know, we're having a lot of applications, like more than I thought. And they are a limited number of spaces. You know, we've rented out a resort. And they've only got so many rooms. But there's still time to apply. We're sorting through applications right now. So click the link in the bio. Also, be sure to join me on Flays. Flays is our uncensored ad-free platform. And baby, this week, we are taking advantage of the uncensored. I'm doing a video on five things you might be doing wrong in bed. Five things that make a girl <clears throat> bad between the sheets. We're going to talk about it because I've done a lot of field research with some guys asked. That's not like I was around being slutty. I, I'm talking to dudes. <laughs> so we're going to break that down. Head on over there and be sure to follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO. I let you guys suggest this topic about the Gates family and it's so genius. The pros and cons of monogamy. So let's jump right in. Okay. Bill and Melinda. First, we need to talk about like the oddities of their marriage, it's come to light that she, I don't know if this is written in like their marriage contract because they didn't have a prenup, but they had like a marriage contract or something, maybe like a post-nup, but they built into part of whatever their marriage agreement was that he got to spend a long weekend every year with his ex-girlfriend down in like North Carolina by the beach or something. And Bill Gates, I know a lot of people have strong opinions about the Gates family. I mean, they're so incredibly charitable. They have donated $4 billion, with a B, dollars between, I think it was 2008 and 2015 alone. They donated like 400 and something million dollars to just one charity in 2000, I think, 18. So if you have a problem with the way they're living their lives, please link us, put it like make a Google Drive and put a link to your fucking tax return of charitable donations. I don't really want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. 
That man spent the first half of his life developing things that would change the world and the second half trying to change the world for the better. It's Illuminati. Grow the fuck up. You sound insane. You sound insane. Stop. But I digress. What also sounds insane, ostensibly, is letting your husband go shag his ex for four days a year, right? And this woman, like, she's like a super cerebral intellectual. Like, all these people are like mega nerds, which is awesome. I think that's really cool. It's not like he's on like Putin's yacht banging a bunch of like Estonian hookers. He's like nerding out with his like metaphysics ex-girlfriend and maybe doing, maybe doing some stuff. He doesn't seem like an overly sexual person. He's like sapiosexual. Like he can only like, like mind meld and like, he doesn't put like his mouth holes against other mouth holes. He just doesn't seem like that kind of guy, but you know, nerds are free. Nerds can get freaky. Nerds finish first sometimes, you know? And then you finish three or four times. <laughs> it's so funny. So this is coming out and people are like, what? Like, why would you let your husband do that? But it raises questions about monogamy. Because when we think about it, wouldn't you maybe want to spend a weekend with that one ex? That ex that you think about and you fantasize about and you silently judge your partner like, James wouldn't do that. Wouldn't you want that kind of hall pass? And moreover, if you had it, if you're really leveling with yourself, do you think you'd still fetishize that ex? If you got to just get a big dose of what you think you want, do you think you'd still want it? This is what I've realized. <laughs> the hardest of hard ways, of course. Oh, by the way, I got a spray tan. Do I look okay? I'm going to a wedding. Speaking of like monogamy, I'm like, yay! This video is about how monogamy is stupid, but congratulations, you two. <laughs> the timing could not be worse. Um, but I've learned the hard way that like I... And we all fetishize the thing we can't have. And sometimes people need a big dose of what they think they want. And so the advice I always give to you guys, it's like, this guy's flirting with this girl and his ex and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, give him a gift certificate to Olive Garden. Say, have, have a nice time. No, I'll see you in a few months. You want your ex so fucking bad? Bye. Go have her. Because people just build something up. But if you can be like, here's the reality served on a silver platter. That's usually all it takes to negate the fantasy. You really don't have to do any more work. So I think Melinda Gates is far smarter than anyone is giving her credit for in this situation. It's like, yeah, go nerd out with Shelly or whatever her name is. I, no, that's actually the new chick who's like, I don't know, like nerd, nerd lady. Like go, go nerd out, go nerd out. I'm going to, who knows what she was doing on that weekend. I hope you were getting it with the pool boy, the tennis instructor, whatever. So there's something to be said for looking in the face, the reality of our desires. And I think it's probably likely that someone like Bill Gates, as high functioning and genius level as he is, he's the kind of person who looks problems in the face. He couldn't have built what he's built. He certainly wouldn't even be able to be as charitable as he is if he wasn't willing to like look at the ugly truth about what's going on in the world, in the world, dig in on how to fix it. And so it's kind of incredible that ostensibly they were doing that in their own private life. But of course, then it's like, well, but it didn't work because they're still getting divorced. Again, I don't see divorce as a bad thing. And you know who I credit for that? Cameron Diaz. Cameron Diaz. Unlikely hero in this story, right? She, yeah, she came out of left field. I'm sorry, this being off center is like bothering me. That's, uh, that's not right. That's better. Okay. She had broken up. She dated Justin Timberlake. Remember that? Probably not, but it, it was for like three years or something. And then she dated, I don't know, someone else, but she had like several like good long-term relationships. And a reporter asked her one time, like, don't you feel bad that you've had so many failed relationships? <clears throat> the balls on that person. And she's like, I don't feel like any of my relationships were failures. They were very successful, but they were a season and seasons change. Wow. Oh. Blew my mind. Blew my mind when I heard that. I talk a lot about seasons. How, his, you know, this past year we've been in this winter, you know, this winter season with the pandemic and, you know, so much fear and everything. But there's things to like about winter. And people in winter, animals in winter, they hibernate. They get stronger. They get thinner. They get better. They get healthier. They rest. There's always a silver lining to a season, right? And seasons do change. And we talk about seasons in terms of friendships. If someone isn't in my life for a reason, then you're only going to be here for a season. And we must talk about seasons in terms of relationships as well. 
people change so much. At least they should, right? You look at someone who it's like, God, she's still rocking that same hair color, that same makeup, that same outfit. Blah. And we can look just at the outside how that manifests as not, not that it's not healthy, but it's just like, oh, like you don't want to try anything. You really, you don't want to try a little ombre, some matte lips. No, just, okay, we're just staying there. We can look at that person, be like, that person's not growing. And we can also extend those qualities. It's like, well, they're probably not growing on the inside. They probably don't travel a ton, learn new things. Maybe they're not trying new foods. They're dating the same type of person or maybe the exact same person. You know, and we can recognize that that's not good or healthy. But we don't take it far enough. We recognize that growth is healthy, that change, experimentation is healthy. We just talked about this in the Billie Eilish video, right? But we don't acknowledge what sometimes has to get cut from the team when we grow. Now, we look at things like, well, if you revamp your wardrobe, you're going to have to get rid of the old clothes, right? Even we can take it so far as, well, you change and you grow and you get sober and you get healthy and you're going to have to ditch those friends who are still in that druggy, unhealthy phase, okay? But we don't extend this to relationships. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I can grow and change, he can grow and change, but we have to still be exactly aligned. Why? The receptors are different. The receptors are different. The things you connected about may no longer be there. They may have evolved. They may have shrunk and receded. But yet we have this idea, especially in America, that you stick it out, God. That you stick it out. You make it work. This phrase, I say to you guys all the time, when I get messages from you and whatever, I want to make it work. Honey, when you find yourself using the phrase, make it work, you're already sunk. You are. You're dead in the water. I know from experience. When I've said that, mm -mm. because typically there's only one person in the relationship saying that, isn't there? Yeah, it's you. And so what you actually mean is not make it work. I want to see how I can do the, the work of two people in this relationship. I want to see if I can force him to replug into me. Maybe the season has changed. When the season changes in real life, when fall moves into winter, it's not summer anymore. Are you still wearing bikinis and caftans and flip-flops in the snow? No. You adapt. You acknowledge it. You grieve summer. Fuck, I miss summer. Don't you wish it was hot? Blech. But you also acknowledge that there's a new season. All right, we're just doing this. I can resist it to my own doom. I can keep wearing bikinis and flip-flops, and I'm going to get some toes amputated. Instead, I'm going to be like, oh. It's almost ski season. It's elk hunting season. Let's plan some getaways. We look for the good. We look for the silver lining in a season. But again, we are not told to do that in society. Oh, no, 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 no. You stick it out. When I hear about people having like 30th wedding anniversary, 60th, I'm like, oh. I mean, good for you guys if you're actually happy. I just don't see how you can be that happy if both of you has gone through what I would view as an appropriate and healthy amount of growth and change in your life. And I noticed an extreme correlation between people who stayed in their small town, worked the same factory job for 40 years, went to the same church, had exactly as many kids as they're supposed to, and long marriages. There's not a lot of growth. And for some people, that's fine. It is. And I, I'm not saying that sarcastically. Like for some people, that suits them right down to the ground. Hey, man, great. We can't all be, we can't all be me. There wouldn't be enough boy dancers to go around, right? There's not enough D1 athletes to go around. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> like that's fine. Different strokes for different folks. But I have a feeling if you're a fan of this channel and you watch this channel, you're probably not like that. There's something in you that's a little itchy to get out, whether it's career ambitions, changing your body, trying a new hairstyle, listening to music, traveling around the world, sleeping with a bunch of dudes, whatever it might be. So, that sort of life might not be that satisfying. But let's talk about monogamy in a historical sense. Ah, this is going to blow your mind. Okay. So studies overwhelmingly show, and there have been so many studies, that we might think, oh, men, men cheat. Men are the cheaters. They're hardwired to spread it around. This is just what men do. Blah, blah, blah. Studies show women cheat just as much. We do. It doesn't come to light as much. Um, women, I don't know, maybe we're just better criminals. <laughs> But also the social consequence for a woman cheating is 
catastrophic compared to what it is for men. I mean, in the Middle Ages, they would like stone you. Fuck, in some places they still do, right? You, even now, financially, when two people get divorced, the woman has, her financial situation goes down, gets worse. Man's gets better. He's paying for less shit. He's only got to worry about himself, whatever, whatever. 30% of women, 30% fall into poverty after a divorce. Poverty compared with only 21% of men. That's interesting. And the majority of men who got divorced cited the woman cheating as the reason why. Whereas women are more likely to forgive a cheater. Why is this? Well, for men, when a woman engages in a sexual relationship, biologically from an evol evolutionary standpoint, now he can no longer be sure that any offspring are his. Even if like they're not having more offspring or she's older or whatever, it doesn't matter. That's like what it kicks up for them though, you know? So they cannot forgive them because for a man to think that offspring isn't mine, like from, from a caveman standpoint, they can't handle it. That's why babies always come out looking like the dad so that the man's like, okay, that is mine. I won't kill it. I won't bash its head against a rock. I'm going to keep providing. I'm going to go kill that mammoth and feed everybody. This is why. And yet women, we are more likely to forgive a sexual affair because we have the knowledge of who's baby we're going to give birth to. You know, again, from this evolutionary standpoint, we have a very difficult time forgiving an emotional affair. We know this. Like we've talked before. I've talked in that video I did about Saweetie and Quave. Was it Quavo? Uh, offset? No. Qua whatever. Whichever one of the amigos. It's Quavo. Yeah. Who's the other one? Runway? No. Something about a plane. Exhaust. Okay. Take off. Is it take off? How about boarding now? Seat upgrade. Economy basic. Is economy basic? Okay. That the, it's the intimacy that kills us. Like when we think about people who've cheated on us, it's not, it's not the in out. It's the vibe. It's the getting your number. And I cried in that video and literally I'm going to start. Ugh, I can't even think about it. It just it makes me sick. Um, it's awful. So let's go into this idea of, well, men are just hardwired this way. Not women. No, no, no. We're hardwired to be. We're nurturers. Yeah, we are. But like to the offspring we give birth to, right? How do we get that offspring? Our bodies are made to choose the best sperm. Do you know what the cervix does? So you have your uterus where the baby is, and then you have the cervix, which is like, okay, so it's like this. Like if you're laying on your back, your, your uterus is here, your cervix is here. It's like a little donut. It's like a little puffy donut. And then your vagina, and then the boy, you know, he comes in that way. <laughs> He's like, Hello. So the cervix is like the door. It's like the gatekeeper. Like when a guy hits the back of you, he's hitting his cervix, right? Your cervix. And that's the thing that opens you. Know, it's like you're 10 centimeters dilated. It's not this big. It's like this big or something. It's something, the fucking metric system, right? But that's the thing that dilates and the baby passes through. So it's the door. So it's, it's the bodyguard, right? It's the bouncer outside the nightclub. So the cervix constantly is analyzing sperm and it spits out the bad, it weeds out the bad, dead, stupid sperm, and it keeps the good sperm. This implies, and studies and science, you know, back this up, that there's more than one sperm to choose from. I don't mean one individual sperm, I mean sample, like from him and from him, that there's more than one, because the cervix is like, hmm, you, 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 you. It's always trying to take in the best of what's around. What does that tell us? A woman's meant to be fucking. She's meant to be out there taking in samples. Do you know that, you know that what a penis looks like? You know, the little like mushroom tip, it looks like a little spear, right? On the top, it looks like a little spear. Do you know what that's supposed to do? Yank out the sperm from the vagina from the dude who was just there. That's what it's for. Furthermore, when a guy ejaculates, the very last like squirt that there, I'm sorry, these are gross words, but like, so sperm, first there's pre-cum, right? And then there's sperm. And then there's a little sort of like, of what? Spermicide. Spermicide. What? He's trying to kill his own sperm? No, ma'am. He's trying to kill the sperm that's about to come in after him. He's trying to kill the next guy's sperm. Again, this is mother nature saying, get out there and be a hoe, honey. Why do we, why, why would mother nature tell us to be a hoe? Because we want as many different genetic inputs so that our body and mother nature can pick the best one and make the best offspring. This is nature. When we look at our closest non-human relatives, primates, they're not monogamous. And there are 
so few animals that are so few some people cite penguins some people cite swans both of those animals divorce they do they will divorce and leave their mate for a better mate a swan will leave a lady swan for a young slutty swan they will and a penguin a lady penguin will be like you didn't you built a shitty nest he built a better one bye gary right when we look at primates and their testicles like gorillas gorillas have relatively small testicles for their size why it's because the bigger the testicle the more sperm it can hold okay well yeah that makes sense so what does that have to do with anything because primates gorillas live in like a closed society like they have their little tribe like their little you know community and so they don't need to compete for women the same way and women don't need to compete for them it's like it's all just kind of like free love and they all this is important they all raise each other's children they all raise each other's little baby gorillas so it doesn't really matter whose gorilla baby that is so therefore they don't need this sperm being like rah we're going to the front of the line because they're all going to raise each other's kids do you see what I mean? Differentially, humans have bigger balls compared with our bodies. I mean, Google gorilla balls. I don't say what I mean. Humans do because we don't live in societies like this, but we did, and our testicles used to be smaller. Let's talk about exactly when monogamy happened, the agrarian revolution. So when human beings were hunter gatherers and we were like walking around. Division of labor was shared. We, we lived in like um, like a commune, basically, you know, and like the gorillas, we were raising each other's offspring, whatever, whatever. Then we started to settle down. We started to take root places and we started to move away from that hunter-gatherer lifestyle and into farming, agrarian. I don't know why I'm getting so hot. The heat's on, sorry. We moved into farming and suddenly physical strength was incredibly important because you had to be strong to pull a plow. And that's what the men were doing. Now, you can say that like, okay, well, men had to be strong to like kill, you know, like an animal. Strong? No, you have to be smart and you have to be tenacious. And that could be women too. You know, a woman could skin a saber-toothed tiger the same way a man can. She might not be able to run as fast, but she might be able to. Plowing is literally brute strength. It's just Pushing, pushing shit. You have a beast of burden that does it now, like an ox or something, right? And so since women couldn't do it, they were home with the kids. And because the men were pulling the plows, they were farming the crops, they were making the money, you know, doing the trade. And so their value in society was deemed higher. Women had less agency now. We mattered less. And to this day, when you look at societies that started around a plow-based lifestyle, the women in those societies, to this day, there's fewer politicians, fewer college-educated women, higher instances of violence against women, fewer educational opportunities. Like, it's not that different. Whereas places that did not rely on plows, and literally that specific farming equipment, not just farming, that piece of equipment, women have a more equal foothold in society. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And then... <laughs> This is why you don't pay for the fucking date. I'm, do I need to get back to this? This is why we don't pay for the date. We're equal. Are we? No, we're not. First of all, we're fucking better. And I don't want to be treated equal. I want to be treated better. Okay? So I'm not going to act like it's all Gucci between men and women and everything's the same, 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 same. Don't give me that shit. Absolutely not. Another thing that our body does that tells us Mother Nature wants us to be a hoe, we don't have orgasms very easily. Now you might say, well, no, because you orgasm. So your orgasm, it's like your cervix is like, it's this little mouth. It's like, <laughs> it's like slurping up sperm. It's disgusting. It's horrifying. But that's what it does when you have an orgasm. You know, when you have those like contractions, that's what it's doing. It's like, give me all that sperm. Ah. And so you're like, okay, well, no, orgasms suck the sperm in. Mm -mm. Because it's so much more difficult for us to have orgasms, we, we can have multiple, which whereas guys cannot. We are therefore, we require more partners to satisfy our sexual desires because we can keep going, but a guy can, he's like done. Like they can't just like reload very fast. I mean, most dudes can't, you know? So a lot of women leave a sexual encounter feeling unsatisfied, right? We know this. The guys like rolled over asleep and we're like, I guess we're done. Okay. What if we had a line of other dudes outside the door waiting? What if society permitted that? What if that was just like normal? Because biologically, that's 
we're not done. And so let's keep the party going. What if, isn't that actually kind of what your body might like? I'm not talking about your heart. I'm not talking about your dignity. I'm not talking about your guilt, your Catholic guilt, whatever. I'm talking about your body reactions. And this brings us to the overall point. Is monogamy biological or is it something that society has created? So when we look at all of this together, it's very easy to make the argument that monogamy doesn't actually make a ton of sense. It's very easy to say that like, you know what? Maybe we need to try to build a better mousetrap here. And of course, this is easy to say. And on paper, it's like communism or socialism or defunding the fucking police. Like this makes perfect sense. Okay, put it into practice and see how well this works. We've all been in relationships where maybe we wanted to fuck around a little bit and like spend the weekend with our exes. But if they did that to us, I mean, our hearts would be broken and we'd be just cut in two, right? And so this is where we run into problems as humans. It's like we're caught between what our biology tells us, but we're also caught between our hearts. And animals maybe don't have that. Maybe animals don't fall in love. Some of them do maybe, but maybe not all of them. So it's like we're evolved and it's like our thinking brain is working against us. So I, you know, I can't propose that I have an answer to figuring out monogamy, but what I can say is that we do have the right to step back and say, maybe this just doesn't work for me. Maybe this really just isn't my thing. You know my analogy I always give. 60% of marriages end in divorce. If 60% of planes crashed, would you keep getting on planes? I wouldn't. No one would. And we'd all start talking about how to build a better plane. No one does that with marriage. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you're worth sticking this out. Okay, enjoy that fucking plane crash. And when a plane does crash, no one blames the passengers. They're like, the plane itself was not constructed right. Lisa and Tyler in row 13 didn't have anything to do with this. But yet when it comes to divorce, it's she couldn't hack it. He wasn't faithful. She's a cheater. He's got a wandering eye, whatever. It's like maybe the inherent structure of marriage is not what's working. And what I think our generation is doing is pausing a little bit. And we're like, hey, maybe we can be married, but we live in separate houses or even separate beds, separate bedrooms. Maybe we cohabitate and we never need to get married because it's a fucking contract with the government, which is insane. Maybe we can just date. Maybe I can be a serial monogamous and have several four or five year relationships and be happy because seasons change and I can roll with the punches. Maybe we don't have to do things the way our ancestors have done it. Maybe we get to choose for ourselves, And just maybe that's what true feminism is. I want to know your thoughts on this. What is your ideal partnership scenario? Is it husband and wife contract with the government? Bah, 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 bah? Is it somewhere loosey-goosey in between? I want to know your thoughts. Like I said, join me in Tulum. Click the link in the bio. We'll see you next time. Shalligators. Bye.